hello, uh, my name is John Mills, and I'm a Canadian philosopher, psychoanalyst, and also a practicing clinical psychologist. Uh, welcome to uh, Freedom Day Global Edition. I'm uh, really delighted to be a part of this exciting international conference. Um, as a comparative analyst, I, uh, I teach in the postdoctoral programs in psychoanalysis and psychotherapy at Adelphi University in New York. And uh, I'm also an emeritus professor of psychology and psychoanalysis at the Adler Graduate Professional School in Toronto, where I taught for 20 years. Uh, since the theme of the conference reflects the notion of freedom, this has everything to do with the existential subject immersed in their own embodiment and society and, and language and, and culture, which we find ourselves in as naturally given. Uh, but, but not only is our thrownness given, uh, so is our unique individual and autonomous ways of encountering, perceiving, assimilating, and organizing lived reality as a meaningful creative function or act. You know, what we may call the phenomenology of freedom that's uh, inherent in the very structure of experience itself. Psychoanalysis has typically focused upon the structural and behavioral parameters of freedom, defined as freedom from versus freedom to, such as freedom from disabling symptoms or neurotic misery, and the ability to live and act in functional and adaptive ways derived from conflict-free spheres of experiencing the world. In the humanities, um, especially within the context of, of freedom for liberty uh, or freedom of rights, the emphasis has been on freedom from bondage or constraint and intimidation or duress caused by others versus freedom to think, to perform, to act, to dream, to imagine. These capacities to do things are enabled by degrees of contextual variance malleable boundaries, and, and multitudinous objects of choice within a horizon of possibilities available to the human being. Whether we view freedom as a conditional state of relational affairs oriented towards some libertarian notion of free will, where there are degrees of freedom both from within and without, we must still concede that freedom has real limits, uh, especially if, if one is not aware of their inner psychic dynamics that help keep them enslaved. Psychoanalysts are used to uh, interpreting the notion of freedom to the patient through the language of defense, uh, such as a need to escape from emotional pain, uh, or to be set free from oppressive childhood complexes. And this is why the attraction of freedom is so important to the individual. Uh, for our purposes, uh, the real issue becomes explaining freedom as an agentic function within deterministic confines, namely the fact that they were born into a specific body or a culture or a language without any consultation in the matter whatsoever. Uh, we have no more control over the empirical fact that we are the product of our biological parents' procreation or union, and we're born into a particular family in a particular time and geographic space. Then we have over the scientific discovery that the earth revolves around the sun. However, within those confines, we still enjoy degrees of freedom to experience, think, and act within the found givens of our embodied cultural experience, which we interpret to be indeterminate in terms of its potentiality and possible meanings. This is what therapy is ultimately about. We as therapists facilitate a process of becoming that's uniquely subjective for a given individual, yet ultimately concerned about 
co-creating a psychic space that allows for self-discovery and creative enhancement in actualizing one's agency, where the client finds their inner voice and freedom of choice to bring about the lived reality and personal meanings peculiar to their own existence, what we may call the individuation process. Rather than read a scholarly paper, which I, I normally do at, at conferences of this kind, I'll be giving uh, a spontaneous lecture on becoming a psychotherapist, addressing key parameters that I think are important to consider based upon my 30 years of clinical practice. I do look forward to you joining me. Well, welcome to, uh, to Freedom Day. I'm uh, John Mills, and I'm, I'm very pleased to, to be able to present to you today. Um, I, thought I, would, I thought I would talk more uh, spontaneously rather than give a, a, a formal scholarly uh, you know, paper, which I normally do uh, at these types of functions. My understanding is that there's a broad range of individuals that are in attendance people from training to people who are already practicing to more senior clinicians. So I, I hope this, this topic on becoming a psychotherapist is something that can resonate with you. Um, I thought I'd start out with um, thinking back on, on my life uh, in this profession and, and thinking back about certain moments that, that were um, pivotal in me becoming a, a therapist. And I guess um, I think one, one thing I wanted to start with is saying, um, you know, what, what patients remember you about you the most is not necessarily what you, you say to them, uh, but it's how you relate to them, how you model a way of being. And, and this is something that gets internalized and transmuted in psychic structure over time. Um, to illustrate this, um, I, I'm mindful of a time when I was in training. I was an intern in uh, clinical psychology uh, and, and, and had already finished my um, dissertation, but I was completing my, my internship year. Uh, and I was uh, working in Chicago at uh, Michael Reese Hospital and Medical Center, which is in the south side of Chicago, uh, predominantly uh, in some ways a mixed uh, uh, community where you had um, wealthy uh, population around the University of Chicago, and then you had more um, working class to poor black families that were in the adjacent area. And at that time, I was assigned a, a, a training and supervising analyst to supervise a couple of my cases at the uh, Chicago Institute for Psychoanalysis. Now, when I first um, met this senior analyst, I was sitting in a, a vestibule uh, or a waiting room where there's a number of patients sitting there and there are a variety of different doors. Uh, where people had offices. And um, the analyst uh, uh, opened his door and he called me by name and I got up and went in and you know shook his hand and said hello. Um, and he just uh, went like this uh, for me to to show me where he wanted me to sit. And so I walked in and sat down and he promptly went to around to his, uh, chair and he sat down and he just stared at me and he just looked was looking at me intently with no emotions and he didn't say a word so i am sitting there thinking he's gonna say something social uh at least something friendly not a not a word 
And so the anxiety and the attention were becoming quite thick. And finally, after about a minute, I said something and started to break the ice. Um, so basically, um, I knew exactly what was going on. I'm being treated like a patient, not, not like a, uh, a colleague, not like someone who was in their advanced training about to get their doctoral degree. Um, in fact, I was uh, in some ways just didn't know really how to relate to this man. Um, he was, uh, you know, despite the fact that he may have been a wonderful um, supervisor, um, I don't know what his personality was like, but he left the most indelible impression. The guy was an asshole. And that is not exactly what I wanted to, to be like uh, myself. So in many ways, I learned how not to act based upon certain experiences I had with my supervisors. And, and you know, the, the feeling is, is that, you know, how would you like to be treated? That's the lesson I learned. Um, put yourself in, in the patient's shoes. So hence, that, that really led me to become much more interested in uh, what we now refer to as a relational philosophy of treatment. Uh, but in those days, um, uh, before relational theory, before intersubjectivity theory, before attachment theory became popular, uh, we, we, we uh, found this more in the object relation school and in self-psychology which was founded by Kohat and in Chicago. And that's what I was focusing on in my, in my uh, training at the time. But this is important because um, these lessons, you can learn all you want from a textbook, from listening to other colleagues, from reading the analytic literature, um, where people often, um, I think, disingenuously present case studies. They're not really how they really happen in real life. And um, so, you know, you're, you're talking about uh, reading how somebody gave the, the, the most precise interpretation and uh, they're interpreting their defenses, they're offering this illumination of, uh, of, uh, of insight. And, and that's just not the way clinical work happens. Um, in fact, I found that anytime I tried to make interpretations to patients, they often fell on deaf ears or they interfered with their own process. Um, so I learned early, it's very important to develop a, a philosophy of treatment. And this is, um, you know, based upon many things. It's based upon your training, your reading, uh, your life experiences, who do you gravitate toward, and I think having uh, a philosophy of treatment is also very similar to um, having a life philosophy because often the two mirror one another. Um, the first thing I would say is that um, for those in training, that, that, you know, I would encourage you to try to develop a, a very sound theoretical orientations. I say orientations because often we can't, distinguish between one school of psychology or psychotherapy and another. There's so many different overlaps. And um, uh, so to find a very uniquely discrete uh, school or camp is not likely to be the case in, in clinical reality. But whatever the, the orientation you gravitate toward to, such as in this conference, in this context, is Many, uh, many people are Jungian-based uh, 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 people who um, are working clinically and theoretically. But um, I hope to also show there's many overlaps with different points of view. Whatever theory you have uh, or theories that you develop, um, they have to be defensible. They have to be something that's generalizable to people. Uh, they have to be coherent and and, and pragmatic, meaning meaning useful, um, and they, this often, you know, it it reflects life too. Um, 
your theory or your orienting principles um, and your philosophy of treatment also guides clinical theory. It's very important, um, in my opinion, that if you feel that you have a, a sound grasp of, of what psychic reality is really about and how that relates to one's environment, one's culture, the contexts and contingencies that define who we are in our, in our lived space, that um, this guides our clinical theory. And, the, and whatever belief systems you have, um, they must genuinely resonate with, with you on a personal level. They, they must be authentic and, and really have a simpatico with your personality. But having this, uh, philo this you know, treatment philosophy based upon sound theoretical uh, orientations, you, you cannot escape having a, a theory of, of mind and culture because you're going to be bringing that, you know, into edit, basically anything that you encounter in the consulting room. So I have a, a, a dual background. Um, I'm, um, you know, a clinical psychologist on one hand and, and a trained psychoanalyst, uh, but I'm also a, a philosopher uh, having, having achieved two doctorates in those, in those, uh, various areas. So I, I, I bring in certain broad traditions that come from, uh, on one hand, the continental philosophy um, genre and literature base, and on the other hand, the whole domain of, of psychoanalytic thought, uh, which I, I want to go through some of this uh, with you because I, I think I just to want to show and model how it, how it helps me approach my work. Um, so within the, the continental tradition, um, we have many, many different uh, forms of philosophy that have impacted upon uh, psychological practice. That they're mainly derived from uh, the existential uh, and phenomenological literature, but it also inf uh, informs the basis of what we call humanistic um, types of, uh, you know, therapy. And what, what they have in common is the notion that we are, as human beings, we are valuing agents or we have agency. Uh, and what, what does that often refer to is that we have capacities uh, for freedom. Uh, we have capacities uh, to actualize certain choices and lived realities that we want to bring about. Um, many people are you know, enslaved by their, their, their conflicts or by their actual social conditions that they cannot uh, seem to actualize some locus, internal locus of control. Uh, and they, they feel that they are stuck, so to speak, in, uh, in their thrownness that has been determined for them. So from the notion of, of, of embracing existence or human existence, whether this, let's say, be uh, from Heidegger, um, the notion of, of Dasein, uh, the notion of being there, you know, being in the world, that we we find ourselves immersed, thrown as part of our facticity into a material world, one in which we we relate, we relate to, and in, in terms of our being with our environment, being with others, but also with oneself, and. That, that type of, uh, you know, three-way relation between self, other, and world is the backdrop of, of, of you know, what, what we refer to, you know, in many ways is the ontology of the self. Um, you can't separate your sense of self from others that you've internalized, and you can't separate from, you know, your, the facticity of the world that you are immersed in. And hence, uh, by definition, this makes the notion of a self a, a relational proximity to certain contingencies that we have to encounter. We, you know, some of the main existential themes that, pe that bring people into therapy is what 
uh, society has to, to deal with on a daily basis. The, the notion that we have a responsibility to, to choose to live a certain life, that we have to actualize or we have a call to actualize uh, certain degrees of freedom. We have responsibility and we have will. And how does that relate to our existential situation where we find ourselves often thrown into a world where we feel completely alienated from? You have a sense of, of a alienation. You have a sense of, of aloneness, of feelings of isolation, even emptiness. And these are what people struggle with in their own private interior. Um, what, what ultimately this means is that we are, uh, that existence itself is our relation to anxiety. Whether it be from Heidegger to Freud, uh, to contemporary times, where now we call everything an anxiety disorder. That this is what it means to be human. This is why the Greeks referred to, to the psyche as pathos. The, for the Greeks, to be human is to suffer. It, we must get in touch with the very thing that we uh, are normatively required to acknowledge. That is that everyone suffers. It's just a matter of degree. Um, and what are we ultimately struggling with, I think, is the ultimate question. Uh, many people are terrified of thinking about, let alone addressing head on. And that anxiety has to do with our being toward death. The fact is that we're not going to be here forever. And that means that you have the obligation to make every choice that much more important. That how do you want to live your life? You, you want to just go through the motions and not think about these things? No, this is what people do. They, de they develop defense set, uh, systems. They avoid thinking about these things that are normative, that inform our very being, and that are unconsciously operative at all times. And closely associated with you know, existential um, you know, psychology is the notion of phenomenology. So whether this be um, from, from Husserl uh, to uh, contemporary uh, people today, um, the notion is really on the quality of the lived experience. And what is the quality of your lived experience that, that's the uniqueness of your own consciousness? Uh, and what informs that? And, and this is what the uniqueness of lived experience or the qualia of lived experience that conditions the way you think and perceive and experience the world is really um, how we unconsciously also structure our experience of the world. And when one takes a phenomenological attitude, one is more interested in what are the unique internal dynamics thought processes, cognitions, affects, fantasies, and defenses, and conflicts that, that drive a, un, a human being to be who they are. Ultimately, that allows us to engage this extremely unknown territory. Because on one hand, we all have universal processes that um, can be applied to uh, to anybody. They are generic to psyche. But on the other hand, they're deeply subjective, unique, peculiar, uh, and, and idiosyncratic to that, to that individual, that unique individual. What this ultimately means is that ther therapy is really about introducing the notion of a self-reflective function or self-consciousness. And, and hence, we as therapists, you know, en enable or uh, help facilitate that process. And ultimately what that means is that we are in search of meaning and, and fulfilling our possibilities. 
So that means that it's incumbent upon us, the patient, the, the clinical or analytic dyad, to, to open up a space or a clearing where these aspects can be explored and, and uh, developed. And this always means that we have to develop a relationship to our past, our present, and future. Because that's ultimately what the freedom of agency has to engage. So from that point of view was, was one stream of my, um, my training and my thinking that informs the way I approach my clinical work. And the other, the other is based upon um, uh, my, my lifelong uh, immersion into psychoanalysis. Uh, so each school of psychoanalysis, whether it be from you know, classical, uh, you know, Freudian theory to um, object relations, to ego psychology, to the interpersonal movement, to self psychology, to intersubjectivity theory, uh, which is what we now closely associate with relational psychoanalysis, as well as attachment theory, um, which is just all of those are rebranded to, to Jungian analytical uh, psychology or the complex theory. There are a great deal of overlaps in the way um, we approach an understanding of the human being, the individual psyche, and our relation to the collective. For classical thought, um, first and foremost, um, whether it be from from Freud to Jung, the notion that you know that you know most of our psychic reality is driven by unconscious processes, and we have an obligation to understand our interior. Um, what brings people into treatment is that um, their internal conflicts or complexes uh, are more pronounced than, let's say, uh, you know, your, your normative individuals who don't seek us out for treatment. Um, however, that doesn't mean they don't exist on mass scale throughout all social collectives. They're just not seeking out um, professional help. But what is it uh, that uh, we could we could say that is important for us to understand um, ab about uh, the tenets of classical theory? And this has what uh, has everything to do with the, the notion of drives or the notion the the triva. Um, in many ways, uh, what what Freud introduces to us and what uh, Jung picks up uh, to develop in his own ways is that the mind is dialectical, that we have polarities, that we have competing opposing forces in the mind that seek antithetical ends and they have aims and means. So is it a, um, you know, is it just merely a coincidence that when we turn on the news on a daily basis, the world is in chaos, there's nothing but aggression hate, destruction. This is the death drive at work. This is Thanatos. This is the destructive principle. This is the Omega principle. This is operating. Why is it that people live self-destructive lives, let alone live in a self-destructive world of a sick, of a sick society? Um, there are these aggressive forces, these negative forces that are bringing about psychic pain. And, and people are often, uh, you know, fixated or under the spell of these destructive forces to such a degree is that they they ruin their own lives uh, through um, masochism, through addictions, uh, through repetition compulsions. They put themselves in the same situation over and over again that bring about the very thing that they don't want to have happen. And yet they just keep engaging in this capacity. Hence, they're not fully aware. Hence, they're not fully liberated from these forces in their mind. They're just unconsciously being enacted. 
And what else do we see every day? We see desire. We see eros. We, we see a world teeming with sexuality. But we also see a world that is oriented toward uh, higher achievements. And, and hence, the dialectic of desire that's in constant um, communication with the forces of the negative are, you know, are part and parcel of our psychic structure. Why do we desire? Why do we want? Because we lack. Desire is our being in relation to lack. And, and hence, people find themselves engaged in all kinds of meaningless, mindless activities to, to escape, to get away from the very thing they don't want to face. And that is coming to terms with their own internal freedom. What, what else about uh, classical thinking that applies across the board? Well, it should be obvious, the notion of transference, of projection, of displacement, of our, our, our minds onto other objects, to other things, to other people. What else do we have to engage on a daily basis in the consulting room is the fact that we undergo all kinds of defenses and we have all types of internal resistances that keep us from wanting to become aware of the very thing that's creating our sufferings. And hence we also engage in a series of repetition compulsions or patterns uh, that we feel compelled to relive over and over again, but maybe in various ways, uh, subtly different ways. But nevertheless, it, it is what informs uh, symptom formation uh, and the things that cause us to, to be anxious or depleted or depressed or, or whatever the, the scenario is. Often these elements are exacerbated by developmental traumas that individuals, all of us on some level, have encountered by virtue of the fact that we're human beings and that we have had to grow up and, and go through childhood. Uh, dreams, um, slips, these are all... Um, you know, compromise formations. This is the way the psyche tries to work out the competing, uh, uh, you know, uh, competing uh, antithetical forces that have different agendas inside. The compromise is that our inner psyche, our, the unconscious, the unconscious ego in particular, uh, has to find a way of mediating these, these types of problems. Hence, um, when we look at ego psychology, uh, which uh, is also prepared by Freud, as well as object relations theory, that our sense of self um, is constantly undergoing, um, you know, transmutations or, or transmogrifications of our in, of our internal psychic structures, and our our sense of self, our egos, if you want to use the term, um, is how we relate to the world in a conscious way. But also um, our sense of self is operative and uh, where, we, where this notion of trying to appease opposites in, in our psyche, to try to find outlets for them, to try to mediate them, to try to blend the tension of opposites or unite them uh, into a new function or a new developmental shape or achievement is often where we're at. So when we look at what does the object relations movement have to offer, it's talking about the emphasis. The emphasis is on the other, is on love objects. It's on the interpersonal relationship we have with people um, and how we've internalized and interjected these people and made them part of our sense of self and psychic structure to such a degree that we often cannot differentiate between another uh, what they value, they desire, they don't like, uh, their prejudicial attitudes and, uh, and such versus how we think, feel, believe, and act. We, it's through some type of unconscious osmosis that we are who we are. 
but like anything in life, uh, we're not solipsistic uh, little um, you know monads that are floating out in space. We're relational beings. And so the notion of attachment to other people, uh, the value of relatedness, and the, the rich and robust notion of identifications is often where we find uh, ourselves internalizing the other. And when I say the other too, from a Lacanian point of view or a Jungian point of view, we're talking about the symbolic, the, the level of, of the, of the symbolic can be everything from culture to language to particular images that have meaning. And, and hence, what we internalize are symbolic aspects of others and society. Um, with, uh, with that, uh, we also have to appreciate and, uh, and think about in our work the reality principle. I mean, People who live in an entirely, you know, fantasized, phantasmal world uh, often are going to have bad things happen to them if, if they're too if they're too much acting out on on what they want, you know, life to be like, and, and not taking realistic appraisals. So sometimes appealing to reality is very important when you're working with clients um, uh, because they they're not thinking about the ramifications. Uh, of what could happen, particularly if they're prone to live in fantasy, like like many uh, you know um, schizoid individuals uh, or, or those who uh, are more dissociative. And what else do we appreciate about this is is that this is the nature of our defenses and how we adapt, uh, how we cope, how do we um, assimilate ourselves and our uniqueness within the confines of uh, of our culture and reality. Another another aspect, another school of psychoanalytic thought is self psychology, which I think I think is very useful because the notion is to shift not simply from the unconscious, you know, transference, projection, defenses, um, repetition, uh, relatedness to others. Um, and the sense, you know, a sense of uh, adaptation, but also how how people um, are, are what Kohat referred to as self-object, they're self-objects, um, and in many ways that this is an aspect of the self that we that we need uh, other objects to fulfill. So it's sometimes it's a person, sometimes it can be an ideal uh, or an abstraction. Um, but it's actually the function that they serve is what regulates our, our internal uh, um, self-cohesion. And for, for Kohat, uh, he believed these were developmental things. things we very good sense of empathy from other people. And an uh, attunement to who we are uniquely is what he refers to as mirroring. Uh, and, and this is something that I think is very valuable uh, to bring into the consulting room because this is often what people need. And I'm going to talk about, I think, uh, you know, what I think these key ingredients of, of um, what a therapist should be bringing to, uh, to the table in a minute. But what we have seen since Kohat is, uh, in contemporary times, a um, emphasis on intersubjectivity. Um, and in many ways, this is just a, a, re, a you know, recapitulation of German idealism, particularly Hegel. The notion that, you know, there's not a analyst isn't a blank slate sitting there and the patient projecting everything onto you. Uh, no, it's a two-way street. Uh, you have two unique personalities and individuals and subjectivities that have to come into contact with one another. And there is a negotiation around a relational space. Um, relational psychoanalysis is uh, what we call it today. And that's been highly um, uh, influenced by attachment theory, object relations theory, and in many ways, Jung, even though um, they will not acknowledge the fact that Jung was very relational and was one of the earliest relational analysts. Um, 
That brings us to, to Jung. What is unique? Uh, I came to Jung a little bit later in my uh, career. Um, in many ways, I can tell you in a nutshell why, that I was lacking something spiritual. And I think that the very thing that draws people to Jung is that search for the numinous. So besides all the other biological drives that um, psychoanalysis is focused on, Jung introduces the notion of a religious instinct, the search for the numinous, uh, the pursuit and fulfillment of soul, or what we are, are really deeply looking for in ourselves. And what does that mean? I mean, that means something entirely different from the secular to the sacred. People are, are different, and, but yet they're seeking it. And, and, and this is what's part of our individuation process. As a self-determinant freedom, that's what individuation to me means, is that we are trying to, to really become and fulfill our possibilities as a process of our own becoming. And it's a journey. Um, just like in, 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 with any process-oriented work, we don't know what the outcome is going to be. We don't superimpose a teleology that's predetermined in the end. No, that's the process of life. That's the process of a good treatment, is that you are working with these forces in the, in the you know, here and now, moment to moment, interaction with the therapist, as well as in your own, you know, psychic uh, dialogue. Um, this is why, you know, this is why, uh, you know, Plato refers to thinking as the silent dialogue that the soul has with itself, that we are constantly in relation to soul. Um, and for Jung, um, you know, this, this transcends the individual, uh, meaning that it's, it's connected to an, an archetypal uh, collective process that is part of live humanity. So whether you want to call it a collective unconscious, the notion that there is this universal connection to humanity as a whole is, is often part of the spiritual um, dimension that people end up entertaining, if not feeling deep in, in their psyche. Um, and, and, and when one contemplates uh, social collectives, we often can identify with these universal processes, even though we're completely subjective, unique individuals. And that, that's a beautiful moment at times because um, it's the I that's in we and the we that's in I. And, and, and there's something that, that brings you, when you see someone else suffer and, and you're you know, in the moment, you're, you're moved, you're touched. You, you feel an instant sense of connection. And I think that in and of itself is numinous. And when we look at the archetypal, we're, we're really talking about how that resonates with, um, you know, our, a, a deep resonance with our unconscious that's based in archaic ontology, the notion of origins. Um, and for ultimately for Jung, he, like, like Hegel before him, uh, in terms of the notion of spirit or Geist, that um, we're ultimately seeking a, a sense of holism or wholeness. And, and that means struggling with these dialectical tensions of opposites and, and trying to, to integrate them, trying to bring them into conversation with one another, trying to elevate them in our, you know, in our internal shapes as our, our mind or psyche uh, elevates. And this is, um, you know, this is our relation to the whole within our own unique sense of um, individuality. Now, I want to I wanna now turn to some more universal uh, 
you know, aspects that I think are, that affect all of us regardless um, of culture. And, and yet these are, I think these are key ingredients in, in life as they are in therapy. So keeping in mind what I learned from my um, analyst uh, in, when I was in supervision, in training, how not to relate to people, uh, the notion of relatedness, uh, the notion of attachment to others, uh, this is immensely important because it informs everything that, that comes from life. So our attachments to our parents are the basis, or they, they are the ontological foundation of mind. Um, so understanding how a, what a person's relationships to their, their parents uh, and their significant others and loved ones and family um, or their surrogates growing up um, are the most important thing or their substitutes because they, once you know, and this is what, again, is a, is a, a, pre, a presumed universal is what you know that um, if you know about the nature of the relationships and, the, and attachment uh, capacities, it will help you navigate and understand uh, why, why a patient's suffering the way they do. Because everybody has attachment vulnerabilities. It's just being human. But some have attachment deficits. Um, and then there are, are many who have attachment pathology. So the, the issue of dealing with um, uh, attachment styles, tendencies, organizations, are, are very important, I, I believe, as a, as a psychotherapist. And, and because of this, um, everybody has certain degrees of developmental trauma. Now, we, we can debate about what we mean by trauma. I mean, trauma is used like, you know, like Pez dispensers these days, the, ter the words thrown out. Um, so I'm not really talking about um, somebody hurt my feelings because they um, you know, called me a name. But I'm talking about uh, developmental, um, you know, early developmental experiences that have left um, a certain imprint on psychic structure. Our, our capacity for attachment um, will often generalize to our ability to love other people, to um, let alone um, show love. And our capacity to form intimacy and our intimate relationships and, and, and valuing others and valuing community um, that this is a, you know, a cardinal element of uh, psychic life. If, if one doesn't develop the capacity for attachment to others, the, the, they're going to be very miserable, very unhappy in their life. And often this is what people come into. Uh, treatment. They're, they're talking about what happened to them as kids, how, how they were related to growing up, um, how they, they can't find satisfactory uh, relationships or, or partners or um, you know, friendships. Um, there's repetitions of conflict wherever they go, whether it be in romantic uh, relationships to interpersonal conflict at work to they have no friends. Uh, or they can't keep friends, to feeling a sense of loneliness, alienation, depletion, structural vacuity, uh, to being, you know, detached and dissociated and split off, um, to being paranoid about others, not being able to trust, not being able to let them in, let others in because they're going to hurt them. These are the things that people struggle with. These are the repetitions that I was talking about earlier. Um, what do we, what does this mean? Uh, the notion of attachment or relationality is, you know, we need to be loved. We, we need to be cared for. Um, this is why, um, this is what Heidegger, why Heidegger in many ways referred to, uh, Dasein as care or a concernful solicitude uh, toward others in the world and oneself. What, uh, Binswager went on to to talk about is really about love, the, that patients need to feel that from, from us. They need to feel that from the therapist, but it has to be something that is natural. It has to be something that develops organically. 
It's not just something that you pretend. You have to be authentic, just like you expect your patient to find their genuine or authentic uh, you know, voice or self. You have to be modeling that yourself. Um, so, you know, being, you know, being cared for, uh, the sense of interpersonal warmth is so important. Um, also, a person needs to be recognized or validated or confirmed in who they are, where a certain, you know, empathic attunement and, and very deep listening and involvement is required by the therapist. This is where not only does a, p a person feel mirrored, they feel um, that you are validating who th their very existence, but they also feel understood. And to be understood is, you know, it's, it's a requirement. Uh, um, to not feel understood is to feel disrecognized. To be negated is even worse. And this is what where we, we encounter every day, people negating us. The world negates us. Um, the notion of feeling felt. When, you, when the patient feels felt by you, there's a, a certain intimacy. There's a certain beauty to that unique process between two individuals. It could be like lovers. Uh, except for we are not uh, we are not lovers in that way. Um, but given that therapy is one of the most intimate experiences that one could ever encounter, the metaphor still stands, uh, which I borrow from a close friend who um, has a book coming out. Uh, I believe it's called um, Lover Critic and. Um, Something <laughs> I forgot, but anyway, I'm looking forward to when he when he when he does publish it. His name's uh, Alan Carbelnig. He's out of Pasadena, California. Uh, what else makes for a special atmosphere in in the therapeutic dyad? Well, it's the presence of the analyst. Your presence. What does that mean? It's a uh, it's you're bringing a certain sensibility or a certain attitude uh, where you're creating a, a reflect a reflective space or a frame for which things can be uh, explored but before they can be explored I mean most people just don't come in and start talking about their most you know deep dark secrets and the, the, the most painful aspects of their life without feeling comfortable with you so it's incumbent upon the therapist to create a relational space where there's a certain holding environment, to borrow Winnicott's term. Um, this psychic environment, um, this atmosphere that we create, this is sacred space, my, my consulting room. It is, it's a space that cannot be replicated out in the real world. It is where people have the permission to go there, that they don't allow themselves to go in, in in the other aspects, um, so this psychic environment that we create, it, it's it's conducive for this non-intrusive, non-judgmental, you know, exploration of one's internal world. This is what once you model the way you work, the way you your your orientation toward life, your treatment philosophy. Once this is once this is laid out for a patient, then they they can at least have some grounding of of what to expect. Now, of course, people who come in and they expect to be given um, certain techniques or strategies for acting, for thinking, like whatever uh, today's um, uh, of course the the mantra from the CBT, the cognitive behavioral therapy stuff. Uh, this is this is all a reinvention of psychoan the psychoanalytic wheel. I mean, CBT is basically ego psychology packaged up in a in a little package, except for um, uh, shiny new garb and things like this. 
except for they don't even address the most important aspects of, of the psyche, and that's, of course, our unconscious processes. Um, but people are expecting gimmicks. They're expecting a step-by-step -step method to follow. That's not what I'm talking about. That's not real treatment. That's not real therapy, in my opinion. This is like you can, you can get this off of an app. Uh, you can watch uh, something on YouTube and you can talk to yourself in the mirror uh, and, and uh, uh, do exercises. The, the, these are, this is to me is just gimmicky jokes. Um, the people who come to see me are people who have tried your standard, uh, quote, evidence-based treatments and gotten nowhere. Um, whereas they come to see me and, and I pretend to offer nothing other than an immersion experience into their psyche. Um, but getting back to, again, that special atmosphere, it's not, um, well, just think happy thoughts, uh, avoid, uh, you know, avoid catastrophizing about this or that. Here, follow this workbook. If you go home and do this homework, you'll feel better. Here's a relaxation uh, exercise when you're feeling anxious. No, that's not what we do. We want to understand why you're feeling anxious. What is the cause of it? What is why is it a continually come back? What's it connected to in a um, ideologically? And what that always comes down to is internal unconscious conflict that has not been resolved. And once we illuminate the ground that's driving a person to feel anxious or depressed or um, the residuals of trauma. And, and of course, when people experience trauma, there's, there's different degrees and rames, uh, realms and ranges. So I, I don't want to get bogged down on that. But often, let, often when a person undergoes a, a, real, um, a, tra a real traumatic experience as an adult, this often resonates with earlier traumatic experiences that they have had in their childhood or their, in their patterns of relatedness with other people that, um, that can compound th these events. I mean, why is it that, P why, why do people get PTSD when they had just a fender bender? Makes no sense. Somebody bangs in the back of your car and all of a sudden a person's traumatized because they're transported back in time unconsciously to unresolved uh, earlier trauma. And this can lead to very complex, uh, overdetermined uh, aspects of, of psychic suffering. Um, just like in life, um, you know, we're all neurotic. It's just a matter of degree. Uh, we all go through episodes of anxiety. We call it stress. Um, we go through uh, depletions or depressions. Uh, we call it the blues. Um, what, whatever whatever uh, we want to label experience, they are something that are universal. The before you can explore though that internal world, what uh, what do we have to encounter? We we have to encounter a person where they feel safe, and and that you've you've given them a sense that they can trust you. You're not just going to open up to anybody. And so there has to be an interpersonal warmth. There has to be this feeling that you have conveyed, whether through your your nonverbal comportment, your 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 face, your way of being, the way you comport yourself, the way you 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 hold yourself in your chair, um, the way you talk to them, the way you reflect, the way you relate. Uh, th this this has to be communicated before a person feels safe. Um, before they can engage in self-reflective insight into, you know, their conflicts and their their wishes and their defenses and their needs and desires and and all these roadblocks that lead them to having to, you know, to honestly look at themselves and and address and have, you know, accurate self-appraisals uh, and develop some kind of, you know, quasi-objective capacity to to analyze their own experiential world um, even though it's completely subjective one needs to be able to develop certain skills from the treatment that they have 
unconsciously imbibed. And they go on to apply this to their own lives outside of the, outside of the therapy room. But of course, we know that um, this has to uh, be based upon um, having a firm therapeutic working alliance. That means a relationship. You have to do, you're developing a relationship with your patient. And that relationship, although it's, it's professional, uh, it's still intimate. I mean, one can have a, a, prof a professional friendship, so to speak, one, where they f relate to you like the, you're someone that they, they can uh, um, feel a great deal of affection toward. Um, whether it be friendly, whether it be in the the guise of a tr of a of a positive transference to um, a parent or a family member or or whatever the, may, the case may be, that often facilitates this process when there's positive transferences. What what else happens? What what do you need to what do you need to provide? Well, what do you want? You want to feel a sense of empathy from other people. That they, that you can feel what they feel. What's it like for them to experience something, and that you're able to be attuned to that. You're able to listen deeply. You you feel a sense of connection, and they can feel that you are an authentic human being. You're not some robot spitting out crap. You're not some little uh, you know paraphrase some mantra that that uh, means something to someone in a book somewhere or following some little uh, pat phrases that you learned or, or uh, you know, your little uh, bag of tricks where you pull out little phrases and do this or say that at this time. This is not what ther therapy is. It really is about authentic relatedness, about who you are as a person that you bring to bear on the unique subjectivity and experiential world of the, that person sitting across from you or on the couch. And when I, when I see people analytically. Um, what does this mean? That means, though, the working alliance is always going to involve resistance, even if it's benign resistance. But it could be extremely dealing with pathological primitive defenses, uh, where they are preoccupied with splitting and you know, projective identification, paranoia, um, where schizoid mechanisms are working. Uh, and and yet, when you're able to work with that, uh, and you're able to make movement, you're going to develop much more of an authentic, intimate, honest, genuine uh, dyad between the two of you. Uh, what does that often mean? It often means that um, we have to get to the heart of the matter, uh, and that is dealing with affect, dealing with... Uh, the, you know, a person's, uh, you know, pent up uh, feelings that they can either articulate or can't articulate. Maybe they're very emotionally impoverished people. Maybe they're very, um, they've compartmentalized their affect. Uh, maybe their dominant, uh, you know, type of thinking is a thinking type, uh, very rational, or emotional life is sequestered. You have to work with those kinds of styles. And those kinds of affect styles, uh, cognitive styles, are, are, or typologies are important because they may or may not match you. Um, it, it is a negotiation like any relationship. Obviously, we want to be able to engender a capacity for insight or, or self-insight. And what what often we encounter is that people have the desire not to know. That deep down they know, but they don't want to know. The desire not to know is so operative unconsciously. It, it serves as an unconscious defense that slowly having them tune, tune themselves into that unknown known, that they don't want to know is going to be a, a goal of treatment, even if it's um, only approximated. And then, of course, the heart of the work, and we can't get into that here because my time is, um, is almost over, but 
Um, you know, working with the transference and the countertransference is so important. The, being able to face countertransference honestly and embrace it and not, not, not to pretend, but to embrace how you're authentically, truly feeling about your patient. And believe me, there's nothing that says we have to like our patient. Uh, but if our countertransferences are impasses or obstacles to treatment, we have, we have the moral obligation to face it. Because if we do not do it, and I would, and if you are not able to work through it on your own, you should seek out consultation with peers or, or other supervisors. If we do not uh, address it, we're just going to basically be hurting the client. Um, we're not being true to, to the client, and, and it'd be best uh, to acknowledge that. So reaching the affect is, um, uh, you know, the emotional tie that you have with them and being able for, to reach the affect is such an important ingredient uh, in, in becoming a good psychotherapist. And it, it often takes time to prepare. Uh, the relationship has to be laid down. There has to be a sense of safety. There has to be the notion that you've demonstrated that you can hold them when they go to these terrifying spaces. And then, you know, the working through process is going to lead to a certain form of um, ego integration. And, and these are, you know, when you're working through whatever it is that troubles an individual, um, their early traumas, um, their relationships growing up uh, that have left a, a residue or an unconscious debris. Um, you know, this integrative process is so important, and, and particularly when one embarks upon having to actualize their freedom as an existential agent in their own individuation process. So, you know, to me, psychotherapy is ultimately about process uh, over anything else, perhaps even above technical principles or, or theory and, in, in, and interventions, um, because it, it relies on you know, the immediate unfolding of inner experience within inner subjective space. In our training that you know, we learn to cultivate a certain analytic attitude um, where we have clinical composure, um, optimal listening, data gathering, uh, maybe some hypothesis testing. Uh, we, we test things out. We have critical reflection and clarification and revaluation. You know, all all of which conceptually and behaviorally guide the therapeutic process. Now, process is everything, and an attunement to process will determine where you'll be able uh, to take the patient, where she or he needs to go. Observation becomes a, a way of being, and it requires listening on multiple uh, levels of experiential complexity, from manifest to latent content, to detecting unconscious communications, recognizing resistance, defense, drive derivatives, transference manifestations, um, archetypal experiences, and, and the differential elements of, of each compromise. Uh, you know, you're also tracking the dialectical tensions between competing wishes and fantasies and conflicts with, with close attention uh, you know, to their affective reverberations. And you're listening uh, at different levels of abstraction and ferreting out your, your own countertransference from ordinary subjective peculiarities. To, you know, all of this to tracing the, the multifarious interpersonal component, components that go on with the therapeutic exchange. But the therapist has the challenging task you know, of attending to the patient's associations within particular contexts of, of content and form, continuity versus discontinuity, sequence and co coherence of their narratives, 
And you're also having to take note of uh, repetitions of themes and patterns and the convergence of, the, of these themes within some type of, of um, dynamic telic trajectory of meaning. There's, there's some type of underlying process of meaning that is attempting to be forged, even if it's unconscious. The, cl the clinician has to be vigilant um, for these competing and overlapping um, parallel processes that, that are potentially active, um, you know, all at once. Uh, thus requiring us to have focal shifts in our attention and process. You know, there's always realities that are encroaching upon other realities. And, and then, of course, affect plays a central part in all this. What adds to the challenge is that affect may not always be transparent. In fact, it may appear amorphous or formless, uh, inarticulate, um, intangible something that's ineffable, uh, meaning that it's, it's foreclosed from conceptual thought or linguistic mediation or specificity or, or qualitative description. I mean, it's just ban it's banished to the, the realm of the body, to the soma. We all have patients who don't know how to even identify, let alone articulate how they, they, they feel. Uh, sometimes affect um, escapes our capacity to linguistically mediate these events. And it takes on a body organization and a language all to itself. Um, you know, such as in the case of, you know, somatic trauma, you know, despite the absence of memory or conceptual elucidation, people will often say, I just feel it. It's happened to me. I don't know what's happened, but it's, I feel it. You know, when patients genuinely struggle to identify feelings only to to arrive at some empty reconstructions or superimposed interpretations that attempt to give it some content, voice, or form, you know, I, I sometimes wonder if this is because for at least some patients, if, if not many, there's these certain conf conflictual, you know, mental events that happened, or they, they transpired before there were, they, the subject had acquired language. So these are pre-linguistic, um, uh, um, you know, sub-symbolic unconscious schematas that have been uh, unconsciously superimposed in psychic structure that are speaking through the symptom. So equally, when we try to... Um, you know, create meaningful constructions, uh, whether it be through a dialogue, through conversation, through offering up questions or inter even interpretations. Um, you know, we have to speculate. There's always unconscious transformations that are happening. Uh, and even if they don't, if a person doesn't f um, uh, remember what you say to them, they might say something happened um, that this it happened on an affective and an unconscious level and that there was some kind of transformation that took place so under these circumstances um you know one reason why a construction can be so meaningful um, is that it unconsciously resonates within the core of their very being namely the feeling soul so what i want to end with relates to this very point. Um, the, the, goal, the goal of a successful therapy uh, should bring about a change in psychic structure. Psyche should be transformed. Um, what we hope to be achieved um, at, at the very least um, you, you know, is, you know, is some some approximation of these of these points. One is that you want to have um, a more enlightened intellect and a sense of self. Uh, a person going through particularly a long-term treatment should come out uh, feeling that they are not the same person as when they entered the, the, uh, the therapy. Um, that there is a qualitative difference in the felt reality of the life within. Qualitative difference. 
that there's also this experiential actualization of one's possibility toward generating meaning. If, if one can't generate meaning, then we have an impoverished internal existence. Uh, you also need, the patient should be developing an exist existential capacity to embrace one's existence, embrace it, and accept personal responsibility for authentic choice and action. Also, and I believe this is often implicit, but doesn't always come out explicitly in treatment, that one should be able to broach the ethical. That the ethical in all spheres of life should be awakened in an individual who goes through uh, successful treatment. And then in contemplating the numinous, and often the ethical and the numinous, the aesthetic, uh, you know, living a good life, um, eudaimonia for Aristotle, um, contemplating the numinous or the spiritual dimension of what gives life value. And, and this usually means a, a genuine and, you know, loving relationship with other people and to sell oneself and one society. So even if we touch upon uh, these themes, uh, I would consider our task uh, has achieved something of value. In the end, um, I think, you know, we're all chasing after a beautiful soul. Thank you for, for joining me.